I was a little bit discouraged because the first day our first customer walks in and looks at our strip. And I think at that time it was like 20, 26 or 27 bucks a pound. And uh, he just looked at me and said, that's, that's more than a barrel of oil. <laughs> and, and walked out the door. <laughs> and I kind of looked at Adrian, my man. I said, hell, I don't know if this is going to work. What's up, guys? We're back. It's the Best Midland Texas podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chuchuk. This is my gorgeous wife, mm. Tara Avery. Uh, today, we are thrilled. We've got an amazing guest, John Scarber of Scarber Cattle Ranch and Midland Meat and the Midland Athletic Syndicate. Amazing name. This massive athletic facility for youth sports that uh, is public now and you can kind of talk about it. If you're from the Midland area or West Texas or all around, you definitely know the Scarber name. Uh, their family has been here for 140 years. John, we're really happy to have you today and we uh, we thank you for being here. Well, I appreciate being here and uh, getting asked to do this. It's an honor and and uh, look forward to kind of speaking on some of this and sharing our story. And I'm such a big history buff. You can just give a little bit about the family history and just how your family has just been here for so long. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, short short version. Um, migrated from Munich, Germany, back in the 1850s, uh, across to New York, and uh, the first Garber kind of took took off down this way in the early 1800s or 1880s. I'm sorry. Uh, got to Fort Worth uh, around 1883, so that's when we kind of came to Texas. So that's uh, that's kind of our year when we got to Texas. And um, John Scarber, that's uh, my not really my namesake. Obviously, I'm named John Christian. I was actually named after a great uncle of mine. But um, John Scarber was the first. He came. He followed the railroad tracks uh, west. They were building the, the railroad, leaving Fort Worth, and. Um, you know, knew there was land out this way that was that was available at that time and um, kind of made his way, followed him, got to Abilene um, and stopped, uh, found a little side job there when he trying to figure things out and learn the country a little bit. And he was uh, waiting tables at a hotel there in Abilene. And he had he had pretty much everything with him. Obviously, he came down here looking to buy in or buy land or buy cattle, buy something to get. And he knew they wanted to be in the ag business. And uh, had overheard a couple of sheep sheep ranchers talking, and the sheep market was real bad. Well, he he basically you know interrupted a conversation, just said, "Hey, what would it take to to buy you guys out? You know, what do y'all have?" They they made a deal right there. I was told it was anywhere from twenty two hundred to twenty four hundred dollars is what what the initial transaction was. Which I don't know what that that is today, mm -hmm. but it, it 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 ended up purchasing these guys these guys flocks and. The sheep market at the time wasn't doing very good, and that's the reason those guys wanted out. And that next year, that sheep market flipped, and he was on a good end of it and grew his herd and kind of ran across some cattle ranchers out here that said, hey, those sheep, you know, you're going to have trouble. Back then there was wolves, and the coyotes were bad. They would get them and different things. So he ended up trading those sheep and bringing in some of the very first Hereford cattle. But in the meantime, that transaction had turned into – you know, the number gets kind of, I've seen it in history books, say 39,000, some say 49,000 head but of sheep were loaded on a train and sent to Chicago. At the time, was the largest livestock transaction oh. in the United States of the sheep, but uh, brought Hereford cattle into Texas. And that's kind of when we started. So, and he had his, uh, his brother, Christian, came down and helped him. And they formed uh, Scarborough Brothers in the 1880s. And okay. then... Um, they get, they got together and called their nephew Clarence Scarber Sr. My granddad's Clarence Jr. He was the one probably more known in Midland just for what he had done because he um, he was born in 1925. Okay. So my great granddad Clarence Sr. When he moved here, he got a job as a as a little kid. He was delivering papers, and as he got older and working up through the family, they were putting cattle and ranches together. They they built a bank here. Uh, first, uh, one of the first, uh, first national banks in the late 1880s. And just to kind of fast forward, 1917, that's when Scarborough Cattle Company was formed. Okay. So, and that's, that's what I, I own Scarborough Cattle Company today. It, it now obviously is what, what holds the cattle and the ranches. But, um, he, uh, when that happened, he got hired on as manager and that's when they formed Scarborough Cattle Company from Scarborough Brothers. Okay. And um, he managed it and ran it 
obviously until his passing in 1942. But um, in that time, you know, a lot a lot went on. He was responsible for starting and creating lots of business here in Midland and really the surrounding area. Um, you know, he sold a Fort Stockton ranch to build what uh, people came to know as the Scarborough Hotel. No, and he's also started uh, a radio station. You know, a lot of people don't know that KCRS was uh, started by my great-grandfather. Oh, wow. Yeah, the, um, the CRS and the call signs actually stands for Clarence Ruth Scarborough. Oh. Ruth, Ruth Cowden is his wife and my great-grandmother. And uh, 550 on the dial on the AM is uh, we brand with a five, and that's kind of our number in our families, the, the figure five we call it, but that's our cattle brand. And then my granddad took over, um, obviously, when he was at a young age of 17, he became owner and manager of Scarborough Cattle Company. And his, his mom had half interest, but they, he was kind of in charge, him and, him and my great-grandmother. So he, he left college early, came back to run, the, at that time, the hotel, the, the bank, the, the radio station, the, uh, the ranches. At that time, we had 11 ranches. Oh, wow. He had put together, well, my, my family had put together a little over half a million acres at that time. Dang. So there's running, I don't know, 20, 30,000 head of cows in about half a million acres. Wow. And That's... he was he was doing it at 17, so, you know, <laughs> trying to. And and so he, he, he grew up pretty fast. Yeah. And, um, but he's, uh, him and my grandmother, Dorothy Scarber, you know, they, and that's a whole nother side of my family that a lot of people aren't, you know, don't really know, but she's a Turner and, um, she grew up at the, what, what's now the Museum of the Southwest. That was oh. her house. They call it the Turner Mansion. Mm -hmm. And there was tragedy there when her mother, her mother was murdered in that house. Oh but gosh. yeah, it was, a, and she was actually injured in that deal. And a lot of history here, obviously, um, when we, when we got here originally, I don't know, there was eight or ten families, you know, kind of founding families here in Midland. And um, that's kind of what built this place. And the Scarborough Hotel was built basically as a place to conduct business. Um, Midland was known for being halfway um, between El Paso and Fort Worth. And so what would happen, everything west El Paso would load on trains and, and, and go to Fort Worth and be sold. The livestock would be sold in Fort Worth at the at the stockyards. If you've ever been down there, you've seen the stockyards yeah. and the, yeah. Yeah. and that, I mean, and they ride off the train tracks. And so Midland became a hub because they'd have to water cattle halfway. They'd unload them, water them. So Midland became a hub, not just for oil, but cattle. They'd start selling cattle there. And a lot of deals were done right here. My dad took over in the early seventies. Um, he became manager and, and operated the ranches for nearly 40 years. And he was a big he was a big part. He went up to Amarillo, bought his own ranch, and still took managed these ranches down here. Um, and um, we just kind of slowly adapted. We always ran Hereford cows. We still do. Um, I um, you know I, I still I'm real involved in the Hereford breed. I'm executive director on the board of the Texas Hereford, and um, and it's just you know one of the three breeds that we use in our cattle herd. Dad's goal as a rancher was to um, create what he thought was called uh, white tablecloth. That was his goal. He wanted our meat to end up on a white tablecloth. Fine which dining. Is, yeah, fine. His version, his 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 way of saying, you know, this meat should be at a nicer steakhouse. We want to raise, you know, high choice prime beef, okay. and that was his goal. So he introduced the Angus breed in the '90s to our cow herd. And uh, by buying registered Angus bulls and breeding them to our Hereford cows, we created what we, you know, we created what we call a black baldy, which is a black cow with a white face. She's okay. half Hereford, half Angus. And um, he, he ran and operated Scarborough Cattle until 2000, oh, give or take 17 right in there. And that's when I kind of took over operations and changed it. But we, in 2010 is when we introduced the Wagyu bulls. And that's okay. obviously kind of what the majority of our meat is at Midland Meat Company. Um, started out as just breeding heifers, which is first caver. We wanted a small calf and they throw small calves and, you know, obviously can't, turned into a meat that a lot of people today kind of crave and are getting used to the, the quality of that meat and the different mm -hmm. flavor that Wagyu produces. Is there any truth to 
if you massage a cow every day, you're going to have more tender beef. You know, the, the true Kobe beef over in Japan. Oh, is that what they do? They, with the full blood Wagyu's, they have been known to, to do that. They will, huh. the, the beer diet. That's what I'm on. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of, I get that away too. The marbling, it marbles up your animals real well, like most beer drinkers. But uh, no, it's a, that is something that they do. They, it's just basically because it's a muscle. And okay. if that muscle is relaxed and loose, it's going to, you know, perform better. And a lot of those animals, you know, you don't see very much of that, that true Kobe beef here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, and it's, when you do, it's, it's, it's extremely expensive. I mean, you'll see it for as much as, I don't know, it's crazy what they'll sell it for. Yeah. hundred and something bucks an ounce sometimes, you know, it just depends. Because my dad would do that if they had bought a cow that they were going to end up using for beef. He would get out there and massage it. And oh, I was really? Like, Does that even do? Well, anything? I don't know. I mean, they have tenderizers after <laughs> after the fact, you know, yeah. for like fajita meats and things. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know. I'd be. I think it would. I'd, I'd have a hard time finding help if, if we had to <laughs> massage all the cattle I've got. John's out there. All right, hey, all right bring next. another one down. Yeah. It's time for your massage, guys. Oh man. <laughs> so no. in 2015, you opened up Midland Meat Company. Yes, sir. And um, it's been described as. Uh, ranch to retail. So in my world in marketing, that sounds very similar to direct to consumer. Um, Can you sort of explain that term and and why you decided to take the business in that direction? That term, farm to table, ranch to table, ranch to retail. I've actually come up with another term. Yeah, I I actually go as far as conception to consumption. Oh, I like that. Uh, Our main goal is to put the, the highest quality product possible that we can produce to the consumer. And that's what I think people have come to expect from Midland Meat Company. Those are standards that we set. You know, we throw quality around. That word gets thrown around a lot. But uh, when we say it, you know, we really try to mean it. Because, I mean, our meats, you know, have proven to be some of the best in the country. And But at the price we're getting, I mean, even in Dallas, we could probably charge another $20 a pound on a ribeye. Yeah. But being here in Midland and the way that we've structured our business – is we want our product to be affordable and we want we want people to have access to every single cut because i think y'all know y'all shop there um um, you don't have to buy a ribeye in our store or filet you know there's denver cuts and there's delmonico's and there there's some 15 dollar steaks in there that are better than anything you're going to find anywhere and that's our goal we would just want you to experience and love you know our product and know you're eating something healthy what do you think is the most underrated cut of beef probably the most underrated cut of meat is the bottom sirloin flat it's a uh it comes yeah it's we (laughs) at first we used to sell it as a hanger steak until we realized there was actually a hanger steak (laughs) that can have a different cut which is basically tastes just like a tenderloin but our bottom sirloin flat or hanger some people call it our hanger it can be used i mean you can grill it as a steak I like it as fajitas. It's like okay. the Cadillac of fajita meat. It's like, it's the best. Um, but it's it's probably the most versatile. You know, when my wife's cooking at home, she'll use it for a stir fry. I mean, it can, you can do anything with it. It's super tender. It's got a ton of flavor. And so I like that one. Um, but there's a bunch of them. With, the, with this Wagyu, all the, all the cuts have become really good to me. <laughs> and it's hard to, like, I'll eat something I never would consider eating out of a you know, an old beef 15 years ago, the way we Mm -hmm. used to do it. Now I just like, let's just grill those up and they turn out great. So I think those, the Delmonico, something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. There's a ton of ribeyes. Midland's a ribeye heavy city, Mm -hmm. um, huge on ribeyes. And I mean, and so I say, look for the Delmonico's if you can ever find them. Um, They're as close to a ribeye as you're going to get sometimes even better because they, they come from a fattier part of the animal. So uh, they cut it off the chuck, so that that meat tends to be, and it butts right up to the ribeye. So it, it's got a lot of familiar flavors, like a ribeye. I, I actually had seen a YouTuber because I was just going like, I'm in Texas now. I better learn how to barbecue. I better learn at least how to like <laughs> yeah. be in how front of cook, a grill. How you to know? actually cook one? He's from Brazil. He was like, Oh, you got to get the picanha steak or something like that. And I was like, I don't even know what that is, but it looks amazing. And then I came to your store. And I was like, They have picanha steaks. You know, and that was a challenge at the first because everybody would come in to buy those ribeyes, those strips, those fillets, the sirloins. And after that, there wasn't nobody, you know, the ground beef and chuck roast. Those mm-hmm. are the cuts people know. And the, the thing is, you know, there's only 
about you add up all those stakes and you add up um well let's just add up the stakes you don't have but maybe 120 pounds of meat there off of 1600 pound animal mm -hmm. okay so i'm stuck with looking at another 500 pounds of this carcass that i've got to figure out how to sell okay i know you you like ribeyes but try this delmonico it tastes just like it at a third of the price okay. you know it's like it's, it's just changed the mindset a little bit it's it's um um you know try this cut if you don't like it you know it's, at least you tried it. i mean there's like flat irons there's things you just don't see in a grocery store mm -hmm. one i think that i think the um the the mastery the butchery is kind of a, a lost art i think we're losing those guys um that actually can cut meat and get those cuts out and so I think that's something, too, that Midland Meat Company, we're, we're blessed with awesome butchers. I mean, we've got some of the best, I think, anywhere in the, in the country. I'd put our guys up. We've got well over 100 years of experience of cutting with those guys, and, and that matters. I mean, if you can ask them, hey, can you pull this cut out, you know, a hanging tender, and they know what to do and go back there and do it, and, and just having access to that kind of knowledge of with a knife too helps listen i know we're in texas and i don't want to necessarily admit this to the to the world but uh -uh. you know i got to the point where i was like i'm so nervous to overcook a steak i was like i'm just gonna sous vide it and even today like her dad her dad looks at me like what are you doing like, <laughs> sous vide sous vide is awesome <laughs> it's, it's really it's, hard it's to fantastic. mess them up it's yeah. very hard to, i was like this is how, it's gonna be this temperature i'll finish it on you know on, i i think i remember when you came, I, I don't know what the year was, but I do. I remember you coming into our store the first time, saying you were from Vegas. You did mm -hmm. all that. You were looking forward to being out here, and you hadn't been here long, maybe a week, sure, two weeks. Sure. And um, it was you were looking for the pecania. Yeah. And I think I told you, hey, this is an uneven cut, just kind of like our tri tips, because everybody's like, what do you do with that tri tip? And ours are beautiful. You know, they're marbled up. And <clears throat> I tell you, if you're not comfortable cooking one, like grilling it, and you don't want to smoke it. Mm -hmm. Sous vide is the safest, easiest way to do it. I mean, it's, and I and I've used this term. It's kind of a crock pot for guys. It, <laughs> I mean, it, it's our version of a crock pot. You're, you hit it right on the head. Because I mean, because you can I stick like it. you can stick the picanha or those bigger cuts that are all uneven, and you you're afraid you're going to cook the tail to a well done crispy, and the middle is going to be rare with a sous vide in them. You can, it's, it goes to the perfect temperature right. throughout the whole thing because it will never get higher than that. And that's a it's it's and there's a lot of restaurants that do that. They won't admit it, but there's a lot of restaurants in the back sous vide and steaks. Yeah, because they they have this, especially the real high ends. They don't they don't want to mess up that steak. True. They don't want a steak sent back to them mm -hmm. and say I asked for medium and this is medium well and you know yeah. so chefs kind of it's a, it's a handy way to cook. I know that yeah, you just finish them off. Yeah, just end? just yeah. have your sure. have your sear ready and and do it. Yeah, or reverse searing is an easy way to do it too. That's that's something I learned. You know, instead of a lot of people would sear then put in the oven and then cook to that desired temp, but I kind of do that opposite. Mm -hmm. Put it in the oven first, get it five or six degrees below your desired temperature, and then sear it, and then you have a more even, perfectly cooked steak mm -hmm. where the 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 red goes all the way to the end, the bottom okay. and the top. Because when you sear it first and then put it in the oven, you tend to push some of that down into the middle Keeps of the cooking. meat. Y'all are making me hungry. How does your beef set apart from, you know, what the, what the average person is going to buy? Advertising is kind of tough. Yeah. Especially when it comes to food. Because, you know, you look at certain billboards, you know, like, hey, my, that looks like the greatest hamburger <laughs> I've ever seen. Sure. <laughs> and then when you show up there and you eat it, you're like, that wasn't very good. You know, food's obviously something that... You've got to like the flavor, and everybody everybody's got their own taste buds, and so I think once we get that product, you know, when we get our meat and people try it and eat it, that's that's really it. Now trying to convince them to do that, you know, at first it was a little more challenging because we were new and nobody really even knew of this idea, and there wasn't anything like it. I mean, west of Fort Worth, we were the only you know butcher shop that opened up that served its own beef that came off its own ranch i was i was a little bit discouraged because the first day our first customer walks in and looks at our strip and i think at that time it was like 20 26 or 27 bucks a pound and uh he just looked at me said that's that's more than a barrel of oil and and walked out the door and i kind of looked at adrian my man i said hell i don't know if this is gonna work but uh and then you know people finally they and then we had one customer that showed up three times that week 
and he just couldn't get over the flavor mm. and couldn't explain it. And that's what that's what you can't put in an ad. Yeah. Because I mean, I can I can take a picture of our steaks all day long. I mean, you see them on our Facebook and Instagram, mm-hmm. and people are like, "Oh, you photoshopped that, or is that this or that?" I'm like, "No, we just took that this morning yeah. in the case." And you know, we can't sell pictures. Obviously, you got to try it. On top of you know the quality, the customer service, which is like everybody there is so fantastic. They, they know your name. You know they they know our order. I've never been to a place that knows. Well, we, we appreciate that. <laughs> and I know, uh, and that's something that obviously customer service is important to us. And and we want to show that you can do that in Midland. You can have a quality product with quality service. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of restaurants in Midland. And, and I love the restaurants because I, I have one. I own one. And right. I'll tell you, they're not easy. Yeah. And so, and you know, something that I wish people in Midland would do is give a little grace to these restaurants because it's not easy. This is a tough environment. And, um it seems like, you know, cause there's a lot of work that goes involved in one of those places. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just, it seems like people are harder on small businesses and they are chains to begin with, it's wild, yeah. Yeah. which is hard to understand. Right. Like we can do a thousand things, right. And there might be one, you mess up on one little thing. And with social media today and the way things are, you know, it, it can, it negatively affect your business. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like those big chains kind of catch that stuff, which, which is fine. Because, you know, but behind every small business, there's somebody working 80, 90 hours. And, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And um, the restaurant business is it's tough. And especially in Midland, you know, a lot of people will give up service for quality food. Or they might get, they might have really good service and their food is average. But Midland's picky and they want good stuff. And I, we sh- we're trying to show that you can do both. Mm-hmm. You can have good product with good service. What would you like the people that are having an amazing steak dinner tonight to just know about the cattle industry as a whole? Obviously, I support beef, and I want I want people to support beef. I think it's a protein that people are going to continue to eat no matter what kind of gets thrown at it. You know, it's that that industry is under attack. Whether it's whether it's the 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 you know the global warming people thinking the cow is responsible for global warming or right, or just animal animal rights people, different things like that, and. We, we stay out, you know, we try to stay out of that stuff because we, we do, you know, we get, we get human care awards for the way we raise our cattle. It's gotten so tough. The food industry has been under attack now for 15, 20 years that, you know, that I'm aware of kind of watching this stuff and mm. realizing it is important. People ought to know what they're getting and where it's coming from. Um, there's a lot of people producing beef. The sad thing is a lot of the beef in this country that you're buying is not from this country. Mm -hmm. And um, when you realize, when you kind of find out that, you know, the major packers controlling the market, they're the ones kind of setting a lot of that stuff out in the market. And those cattle and that beef's coming from other places that might not be as regulated as as the United States. The United States has some of the healthiest, cleanest meat there is any in the world, if not the cleanest. And, um, you know, just knowing what's there and what you're eating, it's important. You know, our cattle, we take we take pride in raising an all-natural product, something with no steroids or, or hormones or, you know, antibiotics. And that's a – labels and things like that, they're – you know, they're – some of them are phony, and it's kind of goofy. Like, I, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, you know, all-natural gets used a lot because that – you know, it's different than organic. You know, the organic people say, well, it's not all-natural. Well – you know, I've looked into turning all organic, but you got to defer grass for 10 years and you can't be anywhere oh, wow. close to a farm that fertilizes. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of go into that thing. So I think that what goes into the meat's obviously important. And um, that's, that's what I think people ought to know, for one. And two, that just this industry is not an easy industry to be in. It's, and it's gotten harder and it gets harder every year. I mean... You know, I know, I know every job's hard, but this, this is one of those industries where you got to really want to do it. Mm-hmm. You don't get in it for the money. Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. There's three major factors to the, to the cattle industry. It's a market, the weather, and then um, management. Okay. And really the only thing a rancher has control over is his management. You know, we can't control the weather. Right now we're in a two-year drought, and it's, it's hurt more ranchers probably than anything. And then on top of that, you add commodity prices going up, corn being high to feed, supplement feed with. I tell people a lot when you look in our meat case here in Midland, 
it's a, that's a two and a half, three year process for that steak oh. to show up. You know, from the time that I turn a bull out on a herd of cows and have selected the bull, there's a nine month gestation, just like a human. Okay. And then they have a calf and then we'll keep them on the cow for close to six months, six to eight months. And then they'll get weaned off the cow and go to grass. And then we'll, we'll finish them. By the time we process them, they're 24 to 27 months old. So I, when I make a decision on like a bull on what kind of bulls I want to breed, what herd or what genetics I want to put somewhere to actually benefit and see the meat. It's, it's about a three year experiment project. I mean, yeah. so I go in it, you know, obviously with some history and our meat, but a lot of it's just going in a blind, just hoping, hoping it works. Cause <laughs> I'm always trying to shave days and, sure. and make the animal more productive than what, yeah. than what I had the year before. Whether you're, end up being right or wrong you're like you're from a management perspective you're making a decision and going like well we'll see how that turns out that's right two to three years from now it really comes down to studying genetics and, and kind of knowing your epds and what you're putting on what uh to produce high quality meat all the time because it is a challenge to get that kind of especially when you're dealing with drought and in like the last two years my feed cost have doubled i mean there's no there's no I'm not going to sugarcoat it, put lipstick on it. It's doubled. If it was a dollar two years ago, it's $2 today. And the sad thing is those markets haven't made up that difference. It's one of the reasons you've seen food prices increase mm -hmm. because a lot of people will pass their costs down because mm -hmm. a, a ranch isn't going to be operate. Being, I mean, if they're losing money, they're not going to stay in business. Beef is a commodity. The market dictates the price, right, to an extent? That's right. Yeah, I mean, you would think supply and demand, I mean, obviously um, has something to do with it, and that's the case 90% of the time. But there's some things that are just completely out of your hand. You look at it, and it doesn't make any sense, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you got even a war going on in Ukraine, and they're the fourth largest wheat producer in the world, oh. that hurts wheat farmers. So now wheat in the United States becomes worth more bail than it does leasing to cattle. So cattle ranchers lose that form of feed because now it's getting railed in, you know, rolled into bells of hay and sold wow. for twice or three times what they were getting for it. So it, it kind of cuts a rancher out, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that affect our markets and the way we have to do business. And, you know, obviously the rain helps. If it rain, that makes every <laughs> rancher a good manager in a way. Yeah. And, uh, and right now it's really tough. I mean, we're seeing some hard times. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's been this dry and 70 years i think uh -huh. I, I go back in history of our family and i'm i'm basically mimicking what my granddad had to do in the early 50s um by moving cattle off of midland moving them to the panhandle mm -hmm. when he went up there and purchased that ranch in 1952 i'm doing the same thing right now we're you know we're at a we're at a we're at a history book time in our family where i'm probably not going to have a single animal in midland or martin county for the first time in 138 39 uh -huh. years and that's it's, but it's necessary. Yeah. You, you can do more. You can do more damage to your ranch, you know, and Trying feeding them hay all the time. It doesn't. Yeah. That that's expensive. Let's talk about the Midland Athletic Syndicate again. Fantastic name, but <laughs> nonprofit organization. <laughs> um, you know, this looks like a. I was like well over a. It was like a hundred thousand square foot indoor. 000. Yeah, this, Sports, this can is you tell pretty us about cool. It? Yeah, if you're, I mean, and we can because we're in the we're in the process of fundraising. Um, really just and why we named it that it's a syndicate because it's really just a group of people that came together um you know midland for all the great things midland has and has achieved there's a lot of things that midland's lacking and and you know and and i i'm big on investing in the youth i think if we're not investing in the youth in this city then we're just building roads to nowhere mm -hmm. and and you look up and you know we why don't we have this or why don't we have that and you know there's a lot of reasons our you know our school district's this but we're giving all these hundreds of millions of dollars away to this robin hood deal and it's just there's a lot of things out there just a lot of what i call smoke you know you just got to see through the smoke but midland's a great place and it deserves to have great things. And, you know, we're involved in youth sports. And one of the hardest things, and it, it doesn't even matter if it, we're talking club sports, because that's, that's a whole nother deal. But I'm just talking gym space in general in Midland. It's next to impossible to find it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a kid and you want to go shoot hoops, there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. or, or like if, if these volleyball teams, and we're talking girls as young as six or seven, they don't have anywhere to go practice you know, up to high school girls 
and basketball. We've we've lost a whole generation of basketball in this town. I mean, it wasn't too long ago Midland High won state championship in basketball. Mm-hmm. A lot of people. I mean, that was late. Yeah, back in the day. <laughs> And we, I mean, we have some dudes that are around. One of them's on this board, you know, Blake Johnston. He's kind of the, the basketball guy on the air and big family guy. And, and um, man, we're just, what we're doing, what the Midland Athletic Syndicate is, is just a group of, group of dads and families, really, that said enough's enough. We want to do this in Midland. We're going to find a way to do it. And through some mutual connections, really – visiting that uh, there's a there's a facility in Abilene if you've never been there it's called the Dodge Jones Youth Center and we went there on a volleyball trip and where 90 other teams showed up from wow. from all over big tournament okay. big tournament yeah. which these go on every weekend yeah and and surrounding cities you know and there's not a hotel in Abilene they're all booked because of these tournaments and we go out there and we play, you know, six games and three of them were against Midland teams. Mm-hmm. So we're going, we're out there, we're going, what are we doing? And this facility is it's first class. You walk in, the first thing you notice is just how nice it is. I mean, you walk in it, you're like, wow. Like, because there's courts where there's like, you walk in a barn and you feel like you're in a barn and there's courts on the ground. Nothing wrong with it because it's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. And you just pull your lawn chair up and you sit around the court and you cheer on the game. You know, this deal's got bleachers, and we're talking, they have eight courts. They have four basketball and eight volleyball. Wow. And what, we, what we've what we proposed to do, and we, we passed city council two or three weeks ago. We, we went in front of the council because um, we found a parcel of land, and we did some negotiating with the city. And we were able to get a piece of land that's over by the Scarborough Sports Complex, just northeast of the football stadium. And there's a vacant lot there, and we've got it under under option to lease in a in a 99 year lease. So what what we're going to do is lease that surface, and we have plans to build a 103,000 square foot multi sport use facility. And this is going to house six full size basketball courts, which also can be converted down to youth basketball courts. Also can be converted now that all the basketball goals go up in the ceiling, and then from the ceiling the volleyball nets come down. Oh, and okay. it will have 12 full volleyball courts. And then on the far north end, we're going to have a big multi-sport uh, uh, field, multi-use sport field. It's going to be specced out for five-on-five five, uh, indoor soccer. Okay. Nice. But it's, you know, it'll be, it'll be get used seven-on-seven seven football. If a baseball team needs to go in there and practice. It's going to be the only indoor facility like it in Midland where you actually have turf and you can play so it's going to take up that whole four four and a half acre lot and then we're going to have parking with the stadium so that's going to help a lot and that was a that's a that's a big deal but we're in the process of raising the money like you said it's a non-profit um you know we're working on all the paperwork getting all that going and hopefully we can get some momentum which we already have a ton of and just kind of get this thing, get this thing bowed up, and start breaking ground here. Hopefully, in the next six months, that's that's kind of what we want. Yeah. Um, but I think it's something Midland's going to be proud of. You know, obviously the naming rights are still out there. That's just the name of our group. But if 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 a donor wants to write a check big enough to name the facility, that right, opportunity's there, there. You want your name on the building? Let's. Yeah, you know. we can. <laughs> Get a hold of John. Whatever, yeah, we we'll name it whatever. <laughs> and uh, so we're we're looking for obviously for money for that, and we've seen some good support. We hope that uh, you know, and this that's something about Midland. There's a lot of support here, mm-hmm. and and there kind of has to be. We kind of got to look after each other here and take care of each other. And I think that's something that this is gonna this is gonna open up a lot of opportunity for a lot of kids, not just in Midland and Odessa, obviously. But the whole Permian, because, mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to – there'll be youth camps there. This thing will be open, f- you know, 345 days a year. I mean, mm-hmm. the only time we'll probably close it is to, to maintain the floor and major holidays. But it's it's kind of an open gym. You know, obviously we're going to rent the courts for club teams and different people that need them to play on. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure if you, dribble, you go up there at 2 o'clock on a Thursday and – you want to shoot hoops, you know, there's going to be open courts there to play on. Yeah. And uh, it's not a club, so there's not going to be a membership, nothing like that. So, I mean, it's it's something, obviously, for Midland. And Midland's going to benefit. Um, oh, yeah. The small businesses in Midland, obviously the hotel motels, 
saw some crazy stats last week. It's been kind of cool doing this, but Midland's a heavy week, week, uh, you know, Monday through Thursday in the hotels. Oh, They're booked up 80% oh, yeah. or better. But on the weekends, it just, it, it goes to nothing. And there's nothing driving. And I, and I, you know, you might laugh when I say it's tourism to Midland, but bringing people here on the weekends, there's zero. There used to be a big, back when youth sports were big in Midland, something just happened. In 2006 or seven. it just fell off. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it was, but there's nothing drawing people here on the weekends. And this is going to do that. With 12 courts, we're obviously going to be able to bring in at least 90 teams on a volleyball. I mean, you're yeah. bringing 1,000 plus yeah. people. That's just the players. Um, so a couple thousand people a weekend yeah. to our town is going to really boost the economy. So the city's going to benefit with tax dollars sure. and and the, the hotel, motel taxes. Those are those and tournaments. Those yeah. Restaurants. You know, hopefully two years we can get this thing. The kids will be playing in it. Okay. Uh, it's it's going to take, I mean, obviously 103,000 yeah, square feet just yeah. doesn't go up overnight. <laughs> so it's going to take a little bit. But um, like I said, we got some good momentum and, and like like the direction, I mean – some commitments and you know as, as we get on down the road you'll see it it'll it'll come out and we'll kind of keep people up to date on what's going on if, if we can get the money raised which it's a 30 million dollar facility wow. you know we're looking to raise 33 million dollars is kind of the number okay look into look in the books for us when we get home can y'all can oh, y'all well, spare open up my books <laughs> okay got it we can name it y'all y'all can oh, name yeah. it the best in Midland, Texas. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, All right. Well, yeah, let's talk on that. Okay. Let's, you uh, got we'll, it. We'll you circle back on that one. Um, <laughs> well, listen, if you've, uh, if you want to open up those checkbooks and, uh, you know, help support, I mean, this is for the kids, uh, and the whole community as a whole. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a cool place. I mean, it's going to be as good as it gets. I, you know, when you walk in it, you're, you, it'll feel like 30 million bucks. This thing's going to be first class nice. and, um, Midland needs it and they deserve it. It's going to be a staple. I think when, when it gets done, I think it'll be one of the single most inf biggest things ever built in this city. I think it's going to influence. I think it's going to change Midland, you know, and keep keep it, keep the ball rolling. I think mm -hmm. it's just going to kind of jumpstart what what we should be doing the whole time and just investing in our youth. Sure. I mean, when we start losing sight of the kids, then we're we're going the wrong way. And yeah. Midland's always been a family town, family city, and been known for raising your kids here. And it's the glue is these families. And if we don't, if we let the kids go and we just become, you know, whatever profit driven in other ways, then there's not going to be much here. Yeah. And, and we've got to build things that keep families here and keep companies here. Cause it's a great place to live work. I mean, there's a ton of opportunity here. Yeah. And, um, I think the kids get kind of, you know, looked over and, and, and that needs to change. And that's kind of, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this and hopefully it helps. Yeah. And we really appreciate your time. We know you're an oh, incredibly yeah. busy man, man. I've enjoyed this time and you know, y'all need anything for me or come by the meat store. We didn't even talk about the half acre, but it's, it's pretty oh, good yeah. food. It is so good. And um, now you're open for dinner as well. You know, yeah, you're, we're open for dinner, you know, um, you have the like new lawn area out there and we want it to be kind of a family place. Obviously we've got it closed in it's it's pretty neat back in there and and uh, we serve everything obviously barbecues our driver but we and that was one of those things we created the restaurant to move cuts because yeah. okay. when, when when i look at that animal and there were certain things that weren't that were stacking up i'm like we got to try to move this stuff so the restaurant kind of helped do that that's smart and um so we didn't want to waste anything or i didn't want to you know have to throw anything away so yeah the restaurant we cater we do i mean you can go to, you know, look, we cater at midlandmeatco.com and we've got a great staff over there. Mm -hmm. uh, John Vander, he, Va Vandergriff runs a restaurant and then Aaron Leslie, who's a renowned pit master in the state, he, he kind of handles the, the barbecue and the, you know, the, the smoking of the meats and, but man, we can put together a gourmet meal or we can give you a, a nice chunk of brisket. So it's, it, there's a big range over there and, um, like you said, it's kind of a neat place. If you haven't been there, try that place out. Yep. We'll put all the links yeah. um, in the description on the YouTube uh, video. And, uh, yeah, so go check it out. Go have dinner. Go buy your uh, picanhas this weekend. Yeah, a little picanha, a little Brazilian steak. There I could go. eat the uh, jalapeno. 
I don't want to call them poppers. It's the oh, the poppers, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they are. They're poppers. Okay. I mean, let's call them what they are. Everybody knows them as poppers. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I tried to name something one time, and I got like 50 responses on Facebook that somebody in somewhere had already named it that. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Like, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a piece of pepper with cheese and a piece of meat in it wrapped in bacon. I mean, how many, how many other so names good. can you come up with <laughs> sure, to name that yeah. thing? <laughs> Thanks again, John, so much. Um, we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Bye. Right, thank you.